So yeah, my name is Fran Jans. Uh, I am an amateur uh, tabletop gaming historian, um, largely because there's very few places in the world where you can actually get paid to do that sort of thing. Um, <laughs> and uh, but uh, and just recently, I started uh, something that was uh, had been in my mind for a while, uh, establishing a tabletop role-playing library, which is easier than you think. Um, you just have to say to yourself, uh, yes, I want to start a tabletop role-playing library, uh, and then begin the process of collecting all the books, and cataloging them, and uh, actually making sure that you... Uh, turns out there's more involved in having a library than just having a bunch of books lying around. You actually have to put them to work and, and uh, worry about things like mold and stuff like that. But, um, so that's something I pulled the trigger on uh, beginning of the year, um, and I'll be doing uh, probably a soft launch on that uh, in the fall. Uh, once my schedule has settled down a little bit, and I uh, put more stuff online. So today I'm going to talk about, uh, with apologies to Stephen Hawking, a uh, brief history of science fiction RPGs. So, a few things to keep in mind. So. The hobby, as we sort of know it, began in 1974, um, which is not to say that there wasn't role-playing going on prior to 1974. Uh, it's just prior to that, no one had really spent a lot of time pulling rules together for specific games. Um, there was a lot of, um, I guess what we would call house ruling, uh, of tabletop war games uh, to sort of simulate some of that same stuff. And there were storytelling games that were going on at the same time, um, but there wasn't really anyone who had pulled together a rule set to bring the two, to meld the sort of two ideas together, that you would have storytelling, and that you would also have like dice rolling and mechanics to sort of determine some of the actions and success or failure. Um, so that obviously changed in 1974 with the release. And the, it's important to note, the unexpected popularity of Dungeons and Dragons. Um, when Gygax and Arneson uh, wrote the game and released it, um, they didn't print... Uh, it's, it's customary nowadays if you're going to do a game, and if you are going to print books, that you do a small print run, uh, because you want to make sure that you actually like, sell through your print run, and, and then you're not wasting your money. Um, they printed 1,200 copies of the first box set, um, which was sold in a wood, uh, panel, like a wood uh, grained co uh, coated cardboard box that was about this big. Um, the only reason it was wood grained is because the printer had 1,200 of them that he was looking to get rid of um, and gave them a deal. That was the, <laughs> so that is why the first 1,200 of the original <coughs> movie box set are a net wood grain box, and all the ones after that are in white boxes that they stock labels on. Um, they legitimately thought when they printed that 1,200 boxes that that would be it. Um, that, that would be, and they expected to, you know, be storing a good chunk of those games for years. They expected them to just sort of be well to sell. 10 or 20 a year, maybe, uh, we'll give away, you know, we'll give away Christmas gifts for the next decade. Um, <laughs> um, that turned out to not be the case. Uh, within about a year, they were done those, and they had to start reprinting um, the original rules, which they then went through eight versions of those of various size print ones. And those are the eight, um, eight or nine different versions of the white box that you'll see. Um, other important things to keep in mind, early role-playing games blend a lot of science and fantasy. So, um, Star Wars is probably a good example of that. Uh, it's science fiction because it has lasers uh, and lightsabers. Um, but the science is pretty minimal. <laughs> um, so it is really sort of leans very heavily towards science fantasy. Um, but it was not uncommon in a lot of the even the fiction of the time um, for science and fantasy to sort of 
certainly a lot of Gary Gygax's influences. Uh, a lot of people think that he was influenced by heavily by Tolkien. Uh, he actually found Tolkien very boring. Uh, he was more interested in uh, Conan, um, like stuff by uh, by Howard, and, and, uh, and sort of that pulp action adventure stuff was more of his area of interest. Uh, and that that pulp sort of action adventure has a long history of sort of combining science and and mysticism or magic together. Uh, so that had an influence on a lot of the early uh, gaming as well. Um, unified game mechanics were unheard of until the 1980s. Uh, one of the first companies to start putting that together um, was uh, Palladium. Started uh, combining, um, basically said, well, we're going to use one rule system essentially for all of the, regardless of what game we put out. Uh, and it was a fairly straightforward rule system. It was basically percentile dice. World, uh, percentile dice to see whether or not you succeeded. Prior to that, uh, gaming companies and TSR is a really good example of this uh, would put out a different rule system for every game that they published. So DD had its own rule system. Uh, Gangbusters, which was their 1920s thing, had its own mechanics uh, that were completely separate from DD. So just because you played DD doesn't mean you knew how to play Gangbusters, um, which is different from today. Um, most game companies when they put out stuff, uh, Margaret Weiss Productions is a good example, um, or Publications is a good example. Um, they use the Cortex system for all of their stuff, uh, modified depending on the game, but um, you know, if you've played the Supernatural RPG, you have a fairly good idea of how to then play the Firefly or the Serenity or the uh, Leverage RPG put out by the same company. Um, that was not in the 70s and early 80s. And RPG creation wasn't really an industry back then. Um, we think of it now as an industry because, of course, we have all of these companies um, that are putting out multiple books per year, multiple games. Um, you know, it is a multi billion dollar industry now. Um, in the 1970s, it was really um, sort of a cottage of industry at best. You read anything about again Gygax and, and the people who were working at TSR in the early days. You know they would print off all of the, like get the stuff back from the printers, and then they would have like their box filling party where they would sit down and everyone would just pass the boxes along and put in all the necessary components and stuff like that. It wasn't until probably into the early '80s where they were hiring staff to to actually do that. So uh, and they were considered. You know, uh, if there was an industry, they were considered like TSR was considered the big player in the industry at that point. So they were doing that. Uh, pretty much everyone else who was printing their own stuff was, you know, maybe one or two people working on stuff in a basement somewhere. Um, so, um, so the gaming industry started in 1974. Anyway, the picture was wrong. Right there it is. So the first science fiction RPG was called Metamorphosis Alpha. Uh, it was written by James M. Ward, who worked for TSR, and it was published in 1976. Um, they knew and understood the viability of fantasy role-playing games, um, because Dungeons and Dragons worked so well, um, and everybody else saw that and went, hmm, fantasy, and started putting out their own versions of fantasy games. Um, and everyone sort of uh, established that. The problem was, um, in as much as tabletop role playing came out of the tabletop wargaming hobby, um, there was a lot of precedent for fantasy, uh, a fantasy bent um, in uh, in that because you had medieval tabletop wargaming, you had you know stuff that could inform. Fantasy, uh, because essentially, uh, at least in the very early days, Dungeons and Dragons was essentially medieval-style wargaming um, with elves and hobbits and, and dwarves thrown in. Um, 
Um, wizards, very strangely, had uh, abilities that were similar to firing off a cannon. So it wasn't difficult to go, well, if a cannon does this, a uh, wizard casting a fireball does pretty much the same effect. And so there was some back and forth. Uh, there weren't a lot of science fiction and tabletop war gaming going on. Nobody was doing, you know, the year 3000 lasers and grav tanks and, and things like that so uh, in those days. So there wasn't, it took a little longer for someone to say, you know, maybe we can get some uh, science fiction into our, into our hobby. And the first science fiction, Metamorphosis Alpha, took place on a ship called the Warden. Uh, it was a colony ship where something had gone horribly wrong. Um, and you played characters who were um, the descendants of the people who had originally set off on that colony ship. Um, as far as you were concerned, the Warden was not a ship. Um, you weren't even familiar with that as a concept. The Warden was your world. You lived in this, in this, um, you know, and the world provided things for you. Um, and you lived in a world that had um, mutants and wonders and, you know, nasty things could happen to you because of radiation, even though you didn't know what radiation was. Um, so you really had no explanation for throwing that fourth arm or third eye. Um, and that was sort of their first foray, and it was the first sort of attempt uh, of anybody to get into that hobby. Um, and it was, it was pretty well received. Um, it was extremely limited as a game, however, because it was very much... Um, you know, by our standards today, it would sort of be a scenario, um, because regardless of, um, you know, you were starting on the ship board and that's what the rules told you to have in mind. So, um, as much as it came in a box set, and there were some you know, um, fairly robust rules for character creation, um, mostly focused around what sort of mutations and things like that you can start with. Um, the play was pretty much limited to you are on this ship and trying to figure out what exactly is going on. Something is going wrong with, with your world and you have to figure out how to fix it. The first actual um, science fiction space opera game that was not, <laughs> basically the first science fiction game that was not post-apocalyptic uh, was Travel. Uh, by Game Designers Workshop, um, and it was, um, it sort of became, um, it did two things. Uh, it sort of became the, the benchmark for um, trying to do space opera style science fiction role playing. Um, it also showed that another company besides TSR could put out a, a largely popular game, which is not to say that Traveler was ever in um, TSR's league as far as sales uh, and that sort of thing. Um, but um, it certainly set the bar for um, what a game had to be in order to, to compete um, in the science fiction realm. Um, and it inspired, um, and by inspired, I mean everyone and their dog suddenly put out a space opera. Um, <laughs> with mechanics oddly similar to how Traveler handled things. Um, Traveler also has a, <laughs> was one of the first role-playing games um, uh, that is infamous, uh, was entirely possible for you to die in character creation. Um, you used a, uh, basically a life path system, uh, and so your character creation was basically bringing your character from like your teenage years up through school, up through like a little you determine sort of how much work uh, experience they had, so what jobs they had held. And while they were going through those jobs, it was entirely possible for them to die because most of those jobs happened in space and space is horribly dangerous. Um, uh, it is an environment that generally wants to kill anything that like breathes or is born. So, um, so it was entirely possible for you to spend an evening making characters. Um, Die off. Um, which actually, I mean, given I think we're all gamers, we all understand sort of that perverse pleasure 
<laughs> beat the system that is trying to kill you. So, um, in response to that, <laughs> TSR was like, "Well, we can't, we can't not put out uh, a broader, um, a broader reach of, of role playing game." Um, so they basically expanded on. Uh, they got James and Warren back with Gary Jacquet. Um, and they expanded on Metamorphosis Alpha and made Gamma World, uh, which was essentially Metamorphosis Alpha, um, but now on a planet. Um, same sort of idea. This was years after a uh, post uh, it was a post apocalyptic game. Um, basically, the, the world had been nuked, um, and you played uh, survivors uh, in the aftermath of that. Um, survivors several generations after that. They sort of neatly sidestep the whole, you know, it's two days after the bomb is dropped, and what does that look like? Um, it's several generations later, which also allowed them to include the uh, mutant, uh, mutation tables they were so fond of. Um, and later on, also allowed you to do things like um, you could play a mutated animal. You, uh, based on, because of the radiation that, that, that happened, uh, you were just supremely intelligent. Um, so you could play an intelligent cat or uh, you know, any sort of animal that you wish to. Uh, and they expanded on that later on as well. Um, those were sort of the big three at the time. Um, there were a lot of other smaller ones. Um, so the next one, yeah, so that was 1978. Um, there wasn't a lot of serious, um, sort of large scale science fiction games, uh, until 1982, so four years passed. Uh, in that time, Gamma World had gone through a couple of, uh, variations, uh, uh, Traveler had gone into a second edition. Um, it always amuses me when I hear people complaining about, like, games nowadays getting, like, another edition, or, uh, and I'm just like, oh, sweet summer child. Um, <laughs> um, I was I was amused by all of the Pathfinder fans who got upset that they were contemplating doing a second edition of the Pathfinder role playing game, uh, and then I'm looking over at Call of Cthulhu, which is currently in their seventh, eighth, seventh, and <laughs> you know, <laughs> um, but uh, yeah. So Star Frontiers was sort of their um, direct response to Traveler, and it came out at a time when Traveler sales were sort of dwindling. Um, Traveler had, um, and it happens with role-playing games today, Traveler had, made, had uh, committed the unconscionable sin of uh, changing some of their lore, um, which, <laughs> yes, <laughs> broke the hearts of several Traveler fans at the time. Uh, and as a result, their sales had started to dwindle on some of their new material um, because they moved into areas that they weren't terribly thrilled about. TSR, seeing that, um, leapt into the fray with Star Frontiers, uh, which was their sort of space opera science fiction uh, playing game. Again, totally different mechanical system from all of the other games that they were doing at the time. Um, at this point, they had. Um, they were no longer supporting Metamorphosis Alpha, but they still had Gamma World out, they still had d and they still had Game Busters. Um, I'm going to get into a few other. Basically, they have five other games, all with different mechanical systems that all required. So, you know, when you're thinking about like all the supplements that they wrote for those, you, know, you have to keep that in mind that they, you know, um, they had to write um, supplements for five different mechanics uh, in order to step out. Um, and Star Frontiers became wildly popular, mostly because uh, it was a, a simpler version of traveling. Uh, there's no way to die in character creation. <laughs> so your barrier to start playing is rather low. And you can dive in um, and just start having fun with lasers and spaceships and uh, strange alien races uh, right away. Um, it was also popular because it was um, 
in the setting at least when it started, you were working for something called the UPF, the United, the United uh, Planetary Federation, um, as explorers, um, but it wasn't anything as codified as like Star Trek is with the United Federation of Planets and Starfleet. Um, so you, you sort of had that nice blend of we're explorers, if no one's around, we're also potentially pirates. It was a... <laughs> Um, there was no alignment system really in Star Frontiers apart from, you know, basically uh, you, you had three different alignments, whether you were generally, generally followed the rules, generally didn't follow the rules, or were pretty neutral towards the rules. Beyond that, how nice you were was really up to you. So, um, and Star Frontiers was very popular for a number of years. Um, again, went through several editions uh, in its own cell. In 1984, I believe it was, they published uh, it again, uh, cleaned up some of the rules and inconsistencies that they had uh, found um, in the first release, and called it Star Frontiers Alpha Dawn, which is distinguished from the original Alpha material. Um, and then there were some other minor players in the, in the 80s as far as. So we have things like Aftermath, which was another. Um, uh, post-apocalyptic game, uh, Cassiopeian Empire, uh, Other Suns, uh, which is a space opera, the Skyrims of Jorun, which was, again, Skyrims of Jorun is a good example of the sort of blending of fantasy and science fiction, um, because while it was set on a, in another world, um, and had the trappings of fantasy, you had characters using like bladed weapons and crossbows and things like that. Um, it also had advanced technology that was very old um, because this was a planet that had been colonized by humans um, and then something horrible had happened to the colony. And basically the, the indigenous aliens, that's not the, the indigenous population you know, rose up and took back um, the place from the, the colonizing uh, human population. And so the game is actually set in the period, probably like a thousand or two thousand years after that, um, where they're sort of reestablishing their, their culture after this cataclysm. Um, and so there is advanced technology, it's sort of broken down, it doesn't really work as well because there's very few people who know anything about how to fix it. Um, so if you find some of it, you're very lucky um, and you can probably be fairly wealthy if you manage to keep it. It's also a distinct that it's one of the first games that wasn't uh, didn't involve um, the usual what we would refer to now as the murder hobo uh, thing. Um, the basis of advancing in Skyrim's of Jorun was public service. The, what your character wanted to do in the game was do good things for people, towns, whatever, um, and actually get them to send a note to what was the main temple. So that the main temple would make a, a note on their wall, like literally carve your name and the good deeds that you've done into a wall. And then every year you could go to a ceremony at that temple and if you had amassed enough sort of for lack of a better term, karma and good deeds, um, you were bumped up in social rank. So, um, and that didn't always involve having to, like, you know, um, invade some small pointy tooth creature's home and kill them and take their stuff. So, I mean, it was one of the first games that sort of <laughs> broke. Of course, that may have led directly to it not being a lot of the other games at the time. Yes. Um, this is also the first appearance of the Doctor Who role-playing game, FASA. Put that out. Um, and it's important if you're if you're ever diving into sort of the history of the Doctor Who and role-playing, um, the Doctor Who role-playing game is distinctive from Doctor Who role-playing, which is distinctive from <laughs> Doctor Who role-playing uh, adventures, uh, which both happened at different times. Uh, Judge Dredd, the role-playing game, you're familiar with that character. This was the first example of this. And this was back when Games Workshop actually did role-playing games. 
Uh, the Expendables, uh, which was even more um, similar in tone to uh, Star, um, uh, Star Frontiers, um, but even more corporate in that you know uh, the corporation would only invest so much money in your endeavor, uh, and sometimes you didn't get the best equipment, and sometimes it wasn't the greatest. Albedo, which was based on the comic uh, Albedo, Albedo Anthropomorphics, uh, in, in which you played anthropomorphized animals. Uh, it's also an anime based uh, role playing game. High Colonies, which is a post, a post apocalyptic game that took place in colony bubbles uh, orbiting the now destroyed Earth. Um, it was a Canadian creation, uh, one of the very few Canadian publications at that time. Again, there was a fair amount of Canadian fantasy going on, just not a lot of people. And Domination, which was um, took place on Earth, but uh, an Earth that had been attacked by uh, by aliens, and so you played part of the Resistance trying to fight against that. Science fiction. So that brings us into the late eighties, early nineties. Late nineties brings us into a sort of a sub-genre of role-playing games, uh, and I put it in with science fiction because uh, it, there were a lot more science fiction-based uh, beer and pretzel games than there were beer and pretzel fantasy games, um, mostly because you could already play fantasy games fairly ridiculously. Uh, I think there's a, a wonderful meme that goes going around of, you know, our d, &D party when we start, and it's like the picture of the Fellowship of the Ring, like the Fellowship of the Nine from the Lord of the Rings, um, and our d, &D party at the end of the campaign, and it's like Monty Python's King Arthur, and because <laughs> 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 we always start with the best of intentions, and then things just go off the rails. So, um, beer and pretzels were sort of the sub genre. Um, they were specifically designed to be played in like an evening, maybe two weren't designed to be like a campaign game. Um, they had fairly simple mechanics. Um, relied very heavily uh, on improvisation. They were almost always comedic in nature. Uh, either in their premise or in the, the actual mechanics that they put forward in the game. Um, so, three good examples of that. Paranoia by West End Games, came out in 1984. Uh, in Paranoia, you played uh, in a, again, post-apocalyptic world, but one that had been saved by the great computer, and you lived in Alpha Complex, and the computer was, it ruled everything. Um, and we were all grateful to the computer for protecting us and telling us how to live. Um, the computer was never wrong, um, and you played troubleshooters for the computer. Because even though the computer is never wrong, um, sometimes people do think that the computer doesn't like it. Uh, and you need to go. And this was filled with a lot of slapstick, dark humor. Um, everyone had six clones. So if your character died, um, another clone came whistling in, uh, in a clone pod, and smacked into the ground, and your next clone basically stepped out of the clone pod and just continued on from where you were. Because uh, your clone's memories have been backed up to the point of death. So, um, and yeah, it's a very good game if you have a, a lot of friends who are okay with uh, the backstabbing. This is probably the role playing equivalent of Munchkin, if anyone's played that. Yeah, so if you like and, and if you uh, play and enjoy Munchkin, uh, you would play and enjoy Paranoia uh, a great deal. Uh, and it's had uh, several versions of, of the game over the years. I think the most recent one was um, five years ago. Uh, they've sort of updated it. Uh, every time they've updated it, they've tried to tie it into whatever the most current uh, Windows operating system is. So one of the updates was Paranoia XP. Teenagers from Outer Space, from Alto Surian Games, 1987. Um, so this was uh, one of the, uh, the uh, anime and manga hadn't really taken off in North America yet. It was still very much uh, a small, but um, 
it, it had its uh, it had its influence on role playing games, and so to you, you can run space. You played aliens who were taken with teenage culture, um, and so you basically infiltrated um, a high school uh, to fully experience teenage life. And so you could have just arrived, you could have been an uh, alien who's been basically hanging out in high school for years, sometimes decades. Um, but again, um, very simple character creation, um, very slapstick, uh, low comedy. Uh, if you're familiar with any, uh, any anime uh, revolving around. You sort of understand what's going on here with all of the your characters that have very anime related um, abilities. And you were encouraged to be as over the top and, uh, and uh, uh, boisterous as the characters in the Japanese anime can sometimes be. Uh, and then my personal favorite, Tales from the Floating Vagabond, which was which wouldn't have made the science fiction list, except for the fact the basic premise of the game is this. There's a guy somewhere in the universe who uh, runs a bar called the Floating Vagabond, and business was flagging, so he bought himself a interdimensional portal. Um, however, unbeknownst to him, the interdimensional portal was not functioning properly. Um, so instead of it sort of following his programming, uh, what happened instead is uh, he installed it in the doorway to his bar, with the idea that it might be handy for, you know, connecting up with other planets and things like that as, you know, some promotional tours and things like that as an easy way to get to the bar. What ended up actually happening was is that every approximately five or six seconds, um, it connects with another portal anywhere in the multiverse. So, <laughs> the direct result being is that someone could be walking through a doorway, say, here in Edmonton, Canada, and you'll end up in the floating vagabond, which is in the arse end of the stellar galactic. Uh, um, <laughs> at first, that was annoying to him, but he quickly realized that the um, the first thing that most people do upon finding themselves stuck in a bar um, on another planet and perhaps in another dimension is they order themselves a drink, um, and often several drinks. So he expanded his, you know, um, sort of what currencies he would accept and, <laughs> and went with it. The result being is that you basically, every game starts in a tavern, um, specifically the floating vagabond, and you can play pretty much anything you want. And that is the, what the game is based on, is that um, and your character has uh, shticks um, that they follow, that inform basically um, one of the shticks is the Arrow Flynn effect. Um, not only will there always be a rope, a vine, um, a chandelier for you to enter and exit a room with, um, you are actually incapable of entering a room any other way. Um, <laughs> and you might think that would be a hindrance in a spacefaring game take you out into like space, but no, actually, if you need to swing in through a spaceship's uh, like view portal or something like that, um, there will be some space junk that has a bang on the wires for you to just be able to. Uh, another one that I forget the name of off the top of my head is that you only accept technology up to your tech level as being possible. Um, and if you are faced with technology that is clearly beyond your technological level, you can disbelieve in it, and your disbelief is enough to stop it from working. So, <laughs> so if you have a caveman character <laughs> that you're playing for the evening and you see a plane, you, we can't possibly fly. And based on that, you make a roll, and if you're successful, the plane just stops working. Because yes, obviously we can't fly, this is ridiculous. Um, there was one based on Arnold Schwarzenegger, uh, most of his characters, um, and basically can't, oh, the Rambo effect, where you can't run out of ammo. Mm -hmm. um, similar things like that. Again, very ridiculous, not really useful for long-term campaign play, but a heck of a lot of fun 
<coughs> um, that gets us into probably the opposite end from Deer and Pretzel Games, <laughs> is Riffs. Uh, Riffs was sort of the big, um, or one of the big um, science fiction games of the 1990s. Came out for the most 1990 itself. Um, <clears throat> and the idea was is that every every supplement that came out after the main book, um, you, you could play all of them together. Um, the idea being that there were rifts between multiple universes and multiple places in our universe, and that would allow you to bring characters and Monsters and stuff, and bring all over the place. Um, fantastic in theory. <laughs> um, it did sort of suffer uh, when you have in just the, the base rule book, you can play an archaeologist, which sounds awesome. And in the same party, you can have a glitter boy pilot who starts with a glitter boy, which is essentially a like. 90 foot tall golden mecha. Um, so right away you're already starting with sort of like a power imbalance between, <laughs> you know, uh, between the characters. Um, that is difficult to, it, it's difficult, I mean, there's there's already a lot of discussion uh, amongst gamers and game masters about how to like party balance or, you know, what if I had two fighters in the party but no wizard? And stuff like that, and it's like that's easy. <laughs> How do I party balance if I have an archaeologist and a mecha in the same <laughs> in the same group? Um, but you also had things like um, uh, it was a bit more adult oriented as well. So you have things like uh, characters that were essentially drug addicts, uh, but the book they took gave them uh, amazing psychic abilities. And And then Shadowrun is the other uh, sort of major science fiction. Um, and again, it's, uh, you know, even in going into the 90s, there's still a blending of science and magic. So the idea of Shadowrun was that um, you lived in a world where all of those magical creatures and things that you, uh, basically magic came back up to uh, up to the, a certain point in the game's history, um, you know, magic was just something that was in storybooks and things like that. Um, and then the, uh, there was the great ghost dance that happened uh, that the indigenous population in, in the uh, North America did, that essentially ended up returning magic to the world. Uh, and so you had both. Um, you know, the uh, elves and dwarves and things like that returning, but it also caused mutations in people. Um, people turned into um, uh, trolls and orcs and things like that. Um, so maybe they got saturated with magic, and if you had the right sort of genetic structure, um, you got turned, which caused all sorts of, um, <coughs> well, for the purposes of the game anyway, all sorts of amusing. Um, and interesting things to happen. Um, it was a, uh, this is sort of the uh, getting into the, the cyber, um, cyber tech um, area of science fiction. So Shadowrun was heavily influenced by things like Logan Dixon, um, any number of anime you can think of, um, Akira. Um, um, but, and it took place in Seattle, you know, was the, at least the original setting. Um, and then eventually they put out source books for all of the world. Uh, and again, this was FASA. FASA was uh, involved in a lot of role playing games. Um, they had that sort of a companion role playing game to this um, called Earth Dawn, which was sort of meant to be, and although they never really came out and said it, meant to be interpreted as the uh, Precursor to this, what would happen if the same sort of thing happened in an otherwise fantasy world, um, or sort of medieval technology level 
and the magic came back there. Uh, and that was sort of the thing. But. So then, other 1990s games of note. You had Aliens Adventure Game, which was exactly what it sounds. Um, this came out just after the Aliens movie. Uh, well, not just after, but post the Aliens movie. Uh, in which you played brave colonial marines um, going off and trying to hunt down aliens. Um, so, basically, if you liked the movie and you wanted to play it over and over and over again, that was the type of fact that you do. And then, I can't believe this game didn't last longer than it did with that succinct title. High Adventure Cliffhangers, Buck Rogers Adventure Game. That was the entire name. Um, <laughs> again, TSR, in, by 1993, this was sort of like TSR was um, flailing is a good word to use for TSR <laughs> going into the 90s. Um, they were really trying to capture any sort of market they could, uh, and so this was their attempt to sort of get, um, get something back. Bubblegum Crisis, which was based off of uh, uh, anime. Fading Sons, which was actually based on one of the one of the first um, tabletop role-playing games based off of a um, computer game. Uh, Holistic Design was primarily a computer game company. They had done Emperor, Emperors of the Sun, um, and Fading Sons was based off of that computer game. Um, the other game that they were most famous for at that time was that name for it, but it was essentially a uh, uh, Machiavelli political slash uh, turn based board game. Um, it was a computer game. Uh, Blue Planet, which was um, you were explorers exploring the planet, but it was also an ecological science fiction game in which um, you were actually trying to save the ecology of the planet that you had, uh, were exploring uh, and had um, unwittingly uh, tainted. Uh, and then we had, and so this had two games, uh, White Wolf Game Studio got into the science fiction game with a game that they originally put out as Aeon. Um, and then the people who made the Aeon Flux um, uh, animated um, shorts, uh, they were just animated shorts at the time, um, raised a stink and said, you can't use Aeon. And they were successful in defending their um, thing, so. This was at a point where I was actually managing a game store. And so I remember having to, uh, we had to return all of the Aeon stuff, um, and it got shipped back to us as Trinity. <laughs> um, annoyingly, in some cases, it got shipped back to us as Trinity um, by the simple expedient of them taking a sticker that said Trinity on it and just putting it over the, the Aeon thing. And, you know, of course, our response was, why did you make us ship this back to you if you were just going to send us the sticker? <laughs> but anyway. Um, and then Twilight Imperium, the role-playing game, Fantasy Flight Games, this was <laughs> the, them trying to go, well, we've got this board game, Twilight Imperium, <laughs> that people like. Why don't we just turn that into a role-playing game? Uh, and then they sort of realized that, oh, that's not working. Um, and that quickly died. Um, and then they just went on to make you know, five different versions of Twilight Imperium the board game. So. This was also a period in going into the 2000s where there were a lot of um, science fiction TV shows and uh, movies that were being turned into tabletop role playing games. Men in Black. Um, which sort of falls into the, um, the beer and pretzels category, um, although it is technically possible by the rules they put in the, the rule book that they put out for you to play it as a long running campaign. Um, I mean, technically it's possible to take any of the beer and pretzel games and do it as a long running campaign. It's just it gets a little repetitive after a while. But some people like that. Um, because some people play games on easy mode for decades. Oh, power to Farscape role playing game. Babylon 5. Um, the one that came out in 2003 was sort of a 
Um, sort of the second version of this, in the late 90s, there was a Babylon 5 uh, miniatures game that they put out that had a role-playing component to it, and you could roll up characters to go along with the miniatures combat, and your characters would improve based on sort of what you were doing. And there was there was the ability within that miniatures game for you to actually take like a role-playing turn, a role-playing break during the miniatures combat, um, and then that role-playing break would have an effect on the game itself. But not technically a role-playing game. It was mostly a, a tabletop miniatures game, a space combat game. Um, so the first actual full-on role-playing game was Mongoose Publishing in 2003. Stargate SG-1. Um, and then sort of the two big ones from our device for publications. So the Serenity role-playing game came out in 2005. Um, they only have the license to use the material found in the Serenity movie. <coughs> They didn't have the license to use any of the characters from the series. Um, which is why if you pick up a copy of the Serenity role-playing game, the versions you see in the book, um, while they do have the crew of the Serenity in there, they are the versions that are in the movie. Uh, there's no reference <laughs> to anything they did before the movie. <laughs> um, later on, um, they, uh, 2011, they lost the license to the Serenity, role, uh, Serenity universe, um, but then got the license to the broader Firefly universe, which then included the Serenity movie. So, in 2014, she basically re-released the game, cleaned it up a little bit. Um, but Margaret Wise Publications is a good example of, you now you have gaming companies that have essentially a house mechanic system. They use the Cortex system, which is you buy dice levels. So the more points you spend on a particular ability, the higher uh, the die that you get to roll with it, uh, up to a maximum of a d20. Uh, in 20 And then you get uh, Starship Troopers, which was an attempt to make a role-playing game that amalgamated um, the book, all of the movies, <laughs> and for those of you who were previously unaware, there was more than one Starship Troopers movie. <laughs> um, I'm sorry if that's horrible news to you, but <laughs> that it is it is true. Um, the other three were direct to video. So we were up to five. Oh, are they up to five now? <laughs> yeah. I mean, good on them. It's not a. <laughs> I'm sure Patrick would be happy. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, books, movies, and one of the things they were trying to basically um, didn't do a really good job of melding any of that together, but apparently it was a very fun game to play. Very similar in tone to the earlier mentioned aliens role playing, who were essentially infantry troopers um, trying to fight against bugs. Uh, and then of course, Doctor Who role playing game. Cubicle 7, so a different version, totally different mechanics. Um, the first version in 2009 was uh, with the 10th Doctor. Um, they didn't do a 9th Doctor version. Um, it was with the 10th Doctor, and then they, every year, every time a new a Doctor shifted around, they sort of updated the game a little bit, so they would put out a new version with new art, um, things like that. Didn't really make any major changes to how the game played, but you know they wanted to update the art so that everybody was on board. Um, as a result, it's one of the few games in which you actually get sort of the addition wars are not based around sort of which mechanical system you enjoy. It's you know which which doctor do you have in all of your your uh, source book artwork. Um, and yeah. Expanded the uh, finally expanded them back into the Firefly um, and then we're sort of up to now. So the big ones now, um, and yes, um, I'm 
I have skipped over a number of, now much like back in the 70s and the 80s, there were a lot of very smaller publications of science fiction role playing games. The reason that I haven't touched on all of them is that A, that would be impossible. I would just be sitting up here essentially reading the phone book to you, um, just listing off <laughs> uh, all of the different games that came out. Um, but also, a lot of them, um, then as now, um, had very small followings uh, if they had any. Um, even the like eight or nine that I listed, sort of in the, the 80s and then in the 90s again. If you look at their sort of distribution numbers, not huge in comparison to um, like even something, and even something like Star Frontiers, which was a very popular TSR game, um, had maybe a quarter of the um, sales of Dungeons and Dragons, if that. <laughs> that would be at the height of its popularity. Um, and most other games didn't even approach that sort of level of sales. So. Um, but, sort of our big three going into this, um, into what we want to call modern times. Um, New Venera from Monte Cook Games, uh, in which you play, um, sort of plays around with that idea that um, sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. Um, but when you play, uh, characters in the ninth world. Uh, this would be not just generations uh, in the future from current Earth, but um, you know potentially millions of years in the future. There have been nine um, essentially worlds, like civilizations that have really been fallen and clawed themselves back into uh, into sentience. Um, and revolves around finding some of that uh, ancient but advanced technology uh, and being able to properly use it without it destroying it. Um, the Strange, also from Monte Cook Games, um, but sort of takes a different tack. Um, it sort of is set in the modern world, but it's set in the modern world in which we have the capability to go between different dimensions and into different worlds uh, and um, blanking on the name that they actually use for them. But they are essentially things like if you if you can think of if you can think of it there is a world somewhere that is that thing. So uh, you know somewhere there is Westeros because Westeros is big enough and strong enough in our collective unconsciousness that's uh, you know, we basically created a Westeros, uh, a Song of Ice and Fire world somewhere in the multiverse. Uh, and so, if you know how to get there, you can get there. And of course, when you have that sort of ability to jump between these worlds, you need people to police them because um, all of these worlds want to be the world. Um, but they can't be the world because we're the world. <laughs> And we don't want Westeros basically wiping us out. So <laughs> you have you you work for an agency that goes around making sure that these other realities don't um, overtake ours. Um, and you work for or you work against agencies that are trying to um, trying to do the exact opposite. And then of course the most recent one is Starfinder which was Hydro Publishing's uh, jump into science fiction role-playing, um, which is essentially the Pathfinder universe, um, but um, you know, several thousands of years in the future. Um, spoiler alert, the world of Valerian is gone. Uh, I can't say destroyed. One of the key aspects of the game is that there is a uh, big chunk of time where no one in the universe remembers what happened. Um, but somewhere in that chunk of time, Galarian went away. No one's quite sure what happened, but that is the, the basic premise of the thing. You still play Starfinders as opposed to Pathfinders, uh, the idea being that uh, 
you know, trying to figure out what happened to the Laird and, you know, and also what happened to other places during this um, galactic um, blackout. Um, and uh, yeah, that is sort of the history of science fiction role playing games. It's um, at no point in time were science fiction role playing games, um, you know, as, as wildly popular as we'll try widely popular as uh, fantasy. Um, even the most, um, even if you look at what would be considered like sort of, if you look at Dungeons and Dragons as being sort of the market leader for pretty much the entirety uh, until Wizard, until TSR crashed, um, they, um, no other fantasy company sort of approach that level of, uh, of success. Uh, and then so if you look at how well TSR's science fiction role playing games did during that time period, um, no one else really approached the level of success that TSR's games, with the exception of things like Traveler was probably the biggest threat, um, but then Traveler sort of shot themselves in the foot, as I said, by making changes to the lore that angered their fans. Um, Uh, yeah. So, I hope that was a little bit important.